again, coming to you in as humble a way as we know how to come. Father, if ever we needed you, we need you now. We thank you, Lord, for the song service. Thank you for the message of these songs. And above all, for the sweet presence of God in the songs and in the singers and in the message. Father, our hearts have been made to rejoice. We thank you for those who've already bowed at the altar and found help from thee. But Lord, we want to look into your word now. We pray, God, that you would touch every heart and mind and help us to think soberly and seriously about the things of God. Father, we pray that you would just touch our hearts and our mind, anoint us. Whatever you want this audience to hear, Lord, if you lay it on our mind, we'll tell them. Pray, God, that you'll have your way through the remainder of this service tonight. And at the closing song, may there be even more thou at this altar of prayer and find help from God. Surely we'll bow our heads and humble our hearts and give your name the praise and glory for it all. Amen. Amen. Scripture lesson tonight found in the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, reading from verse 17 through verse 32. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself. For what he seeth the Father do? For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Look back to the 24th and the 25th verses for a text. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I thank God tonight for the truth of that statement. And for the privilege we everyone have 
of taking part in that resurrection that Jesus speaks of right here. I want to talk to you tonight about the first resurrection. In this fifth chapter of John, we find Jesus, like we often find him in the scriptures, in controversy with the unbelieving Jews. This time he's in controversy with them over the fact that he heals a man on the Sabbath day. That caused him much trouble along the way while he was here on earth. The fifth chapter tells us the Jews had a feast up at Jerusalem. Jesus went up to the feast and he went out to the sheep market just outside Jerusalem and beside the sheep market there's a pool called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda that has five porches. And under those porches, John tells us there was a multitude of impotent folks, of blind and halt and withered and uh, maimed and lame, sickness of various kinds. Uh, they were waiting on the troubling of the waters. For an angel went down at a certain season and troubled the waters of that uh, lake or that body of water. And the first one stepping in after the waters were troubled was healed. And Jesus walked among those people, the multitude of people, and he came to a man who uh, had an infirmity, 38 years. And he asked this man, Wilt thou be made whole? This man answered and said, Sir, I have no man that when the water's troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. And Jesus spoke to this man and said, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Amen. And instantly the power of God went through that body and completely destroyed that infirmity that had been standing for 38 years. I can picture that man as he jumped off of that bed and began to leap, shout, and praise the Lord. I believe, brother, there was a scene of rejoicing right there at that moment. And Jesus had conveyed himself away into the crowd, lost himself in the multitude, after the man rejoiced and praised God for a while, then he picked up his bed and started off with it, headed toward home. He had a message for the folks at home. Somebody's healed me. Well, he hadn't gone very far until the Jews collared him and said, Listen, it isn't lawful for you to carry your bed on the Sabbath. Why, he said, the man that healed me told me. Well, we'd like to know who told you to do that. Well, the man wist not who it was because Jesus had conveyed himself away and lost himself in the crowd. But the scripture goes on to tell us that Jesus found him later in the temple. He went to church, didn't he? Thank the Lord. Found his way to the temple to express his praise and gratitude to God for healing him. Jesus met him there and he said, Now you've been made whole. Go on, he said, don't sin anymore. Let the worst thing come on you. Well, this man went out immediately and told the Jews it was Jesus that healed him. Then they began to persecute him and trying to kill him, get rid of him. And he begins to speak to them here in our lesson as we read. He said, my father worketh hitherto and I work. And when he aligned himself with the Almighty God, then the Jews had two charges against him. He had broken the Sabbath day. That was their first charge. And now he's made himself equal with God. So they set out to get rid of him, kill him, destroy him. And he began to teach them. In this 20, uh, or the 17th through the 23rd verses, uh, he shows them the relationship between the Son and the Father. And he said, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. Whatsoever he seeth the Father do, he also do, uh, the Son also doeth likewise. Listen, dear ones, he goes on to tell them 
and his earthly ministry had been coordinated with the will and with the work of the Heavenly Father. And goes right on to tell them that all men should honor the Son as they honor the Father. And whosoever honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father. And this the Jews did not do because of unbelief in their hearts. They professed to be the children of God, yet they were alienated from God because of their unbelieving heart. Then Jesus goes right into that 24th verse and teaches those Jews what they'll have to do to obtain everlasting life. Now listen, there's many people today just like the man who came running to Jesus and fell at his feet and said, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And when the requirements were set before him, he wasn't willing to pay the price. He walked away sorrowful. I want to tell you, as Jesus told the Jews on that day, there's some things you're going to have to do if you ever inherit everlasting life. It doesn't come by wishful thinking. Some Bible conditions we'll have to meet. And Jesus set forth those requirements right here in the 24th verse. Amen. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Amen. Now, the, he had already taught them that the Father loved them back in the third chapter and the 16th verse. He said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. For he sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Then in the 36th verse of the same chapter, he said, He that believeth the Son hath life. He that believeth not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. Amen. Then he comes right along here now and tells them, The Father hath loves you, but you have to hear me, and you have to believe in the Father if you inherit everlasting life. Now Jesus teaches us right here a resurrection that can be partaken of by choice and that right here at the present moment. He taught those listening Jews back there centuries ago that if you make your choice and hear my word and believe in the Father that sent me, you can have everlasting life right here now. A resurrection that is present and one that we can take part in by choice and meeting the conditions of the Word. I say to every one of you who are here in sin tonight, you, before you leave this service, have the privilege of making your choice and surrendering to God and taking part in this first resurrection. And if you reject that, you're lost. Now he goes on down a little farther in the scripture lesson and teaches another resurrection to the same audience of people. Verses 28 and 29, he said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Jesus taught that group of Jews to resurrection. Right there on the same occasion. Now everyone will take part in the resurrection he spoke of in verses 28 and 29. That will not be by choice. That's the general resurrection of all the dead when Jesus comes back the second time. 
Another hill split the sky. They'll roll back as a scroll, or rather, I, I'd better say they'll be burned up. Amen. Peter said the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, yeah. in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, yeah. and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Yeah. When Christ appears the second time, He'll burn the old earth and everything in it. He'll burn it up. And all the dead, wicked and righteous, will come forth. And the human race will stand face to face with their Creator. Those who slept in the dust of the earth for hundreds and thousands of years, they'll come forth. And there's a day of reckoning when every one of us will stand in the presence of our God Amen. and render an account of the way we've lived in this life. Amen. That's the second general, uh, the second resurrection, the general resurrection yeah. of all the dead. Amen. Now the Bible definitely teaches two resurrections. But I suppose there's as much confusion and as much false doctrine and deception going forth in regards to the two resurrections that's taught in the Bible as about any subject you can find in the Bible. One of the most prominent uh, teachings today and one that's embraced by uh, the greater majority of people is that both of the resurrections are literal resurrections. And the first resurrection, it's taught, will take place when Christ comes the second time and the righteous dead will come forth and they'll reign here on the earth with Christ a thousand years. And after the thousand years are over, the second resurrection will take place and then will come forth the wicked dead. But brother, let me tell you, that isn't in your Bible. That teaching is not in the Word. The teaching of a thousand years reign here on the earth with Christ is not in the Bible. Right back to 2 Peter 3 and 9, 3 and 10 rather, he said the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, not burned over, not re-eatenized and purified, but burned up. and cease to exist. Brother, I'm glad tonight to tell you the reign of God's people on earth is a present day reign. Amen. I'm a king tonight. I'm a priest. I'm reigning with Christ now. Amen. Revelation 1, 5 and 6. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Amen. and hath made us kings and priests. Amen. Unto him be glory and honor Amen. forever. Amen. I'm a king. I'm a priest. Kings reign and priests offer up sacrifices to God. And I'm doing both. Glory to God. Amen. Reigning over Satan, sin, Self, the world, the beast, his image, his mark, his name, reigning over everything. Amen. Paul said in Romans 5 and 17, For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Who's he talking about? If by Adam's transgression, by his offense, death reigned over the whole human race. I know folks don't like to swallow that, but it's in your Bible. 
Yeah. Folks like to tell us that every child born in the world comes with a clean, pure spirit. Brother, there isn't a word of truth in it. Brother, I'm at a loss to know how a mother or a father can accept the teaching that there's no carnal nature in a person. You know how they can throw a fit. They can throw them too. Put their heads on the floor and kick the floor. And... Amen. You did too and so did I. Paul oh, said, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life yes. by one, Jesus Christ. Yes. Now, the true saints of God are reigning in life by Jesus Christ. Yes. Don't have to bow down to the enemy on any school. Thank God for victory. Thank God for reigning grace. Amen. All right, let me tell you again. The doctrine of the millennium isn't in the Bible. The word nowhere teaches a thousand years reign on the earth with Christ. Maybe you say, preacher, what are you going to do in Revelation 20? I'm going to leave it right there. Yes, but what are you going to do with the teaching? Just believe it as it is. Listen, there isn't one verse in that chapter, there isn't one word in that chapter that even intimates such a thing as people reigning on earth with Christ. John said in the fourth verse, And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given unto them. And he said, I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. He saw souls, S-O-U-L-S, the departed souls, departed spirits of the martyrs who died in defense of the gospel. They were reigning with Christ in paradise, not on the earth. Not on the earth. Amen. All right, there's another doctrine concerning the two resurrections that's come forth, and it's being propagated by professed Church of God preachers. And I stress the word professed. They go to the sixth chapter of Revelation, the ninth verse, where the fifth seal was opened, and John said, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. And then they go over to Revelation 20 and 4, the verse I just referred to, and it says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, Neither had received his mark upon their forehead or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Amen. Now those preachers take those two pictures, those two verses of martyred souls reigning with Christ under the altar in paradise, and they say those two groups of martyred saints have had part in the first resurrection, which they say is literal, and they have been resurrected bodily, already have their immortal bodies, and they've ascended bodily to live with God in heaven, and that's where John saw them. That isn't where the Bible says John saw. Amen. All right, now get it. They say those two groups have been resurrected bodily, ascended to heaven, and that's the first resurrection, and the rest of the saints will take part in the last general resurrection, but those two groups will have no part in it. 
You say, Church of God preachers preaching that? I said, profess Church of God preachers. Now you know that runs right along in harmony with Roman Catholicism's doctrine that Mary, the mother of Jesus, has already been resurrected bodily and she has ascended into heaven in the presence of God bodily. That's their teaching, that's dogma as far as Roman Catholicism is concerned. I want to tell you they're both wrong. Well, how do you know they're wrong? All I have to do is go to my Bible. Turn to the third chapter of John, the 13th verse, where Jesus was teaching Nicodemus about the new birth. And in the 13th verse, Jesus said, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he which came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, Oh, you say, that don't prove anything, doesn't it? It just says no man's ascended up to heaven. Amen. Amen. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, the resurrection chapter. You know, there were some people there in Corinth that didn't believe in the resurrection. Right among the saints. And Paul trying to get them straightened out. And that 15th chapter is a long chapter and a, it's dealing with the resurrection. And the Apostle Paul said to those people, Now if Christ be preached that he's raised from the dead, how do some of you folks contend to say there's no resurrection? But he said, If there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And he said, Our preaching is vain, and your faith is vain. Well, brother, I'm glad he is risen. He went right on in that 20th verse, and he said, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. Thank God they nailed him on the cross, took him down and put him in Joseph's new-made tomb, rolled a stone over it, sealed it with a government seal, posted a soldier guard there, but God in heaven spoke and out of there came the Son of Man. The stone rolled away. The soldiers fell dead. And Christ came up for the living Christ. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. Now read verse 23 and see what he said. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Let me say, dear ones, the martyrs you read about in those two verses of Scripture, and the mother, the Ma or Mary, the mother of Jesus, not any one of them has been resurrected bodily as yet. They're still in the grave awaiting that last final trumpet call when everybody will come forth. Christ is the first fruits of every man in his own order. Every man at his coming. Amen. Now, back to these two verses, 25, 24, and 25 in our scripture lesson. Jesus is teaching a spiritual resurrection there. And brother, it is vital to Christianity and to the Christian. You can't be a Christian and not take part in the first resurrection. You can't have Christianity and leave out the first resurrection. Jesus said in John 10 and 10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. What kind of life did he bring? He brought spiritual life, everlasting life, eternal life. They already had physical life. He came, brother, his mission was to bring everlasting life to the human race. Amen. That was his mission. Had he not come, we wouldn't have life. We'd everyone be consigned to a lost eternity Amen. had he not come. Oh, I thank God he did come. Amen. And he brought eternal life with him. 
Now he said in verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word. Now get what he's teaching here. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. You can't deny that is a resurrection. Amen. It's as simple as two and two is four. But yet the great masses of people are blinded to it. Multitudes of preachers are blinded to it. And you begin to teach it and put it in print and distribute it a little bit, you'll get some repercussion from it. You can't deny Jesus' teaching the resurrection there. Can't be denied. Then he went right on in the 25th verse, and he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is. Thank God. He told those Jews back there, the hour is coming, and it now is. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. I want you to note, beloved, he's talking there to dead people who can hear and do something. He isn't talking to naturally or physically dead people. He's talking to dead people who can hear and respond to what they hear. And he lets us know definitely that those Jews back there had the privilege of partaking of it right then and there. Amen. Now listen, there can be no resurrection without an existing death. Amen. The word resurrect means to restore to life. It means to bring back to life from the dead. And the fact that Jesus Christ is teaching a resurrection here to some dead people, and yet they're alive people, we know that it's a spiritual resurrection. Amen. I want you to consider with me a few moments the two deaths the Bible speaks of. It teaches two deaths as well as two births as well as two resurrections. Two deaths. A spiritual death and a natural death. And both of them come as a result of disobedience to God. Amen. The result of sin. First of all, I want you to think with me about spiritual death. Going back in thought to the first book of the Bible, God tells us in the book of Genesis, and Adam and Eve, the first two creatures on earth, was created in the image of God and in the likeness of God. That does have, not have any reference to the physical body of man because God has not a corporeal body. God is a spirit. And when you read that in the Bible, you must remember that that is referring to the soul, the spirit, the inner man there. That inner conscious entity that's living inside this old chunk of clay has nothing to do with it. the clay. Amen. On the authority of that scripture, I say that Adam and Eve was created holy and pure and righteous Amen. as much as the Almighty God is holy, Amen. pure, and righteous. Amen. They were in His image. He came down and walked with them in the garden, having fellowship with them. And the first mention that's made of death in the Bible is in Genesis 2 and 17, where God was telling those first two people, you can eat the fruit of this garden, everything in the garden, except that one tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if you eat that or in the day you eat it, you'll die. That's the first mention that's made of death in the Bible. You go right on and read in the third chapter of Genesis uh, the temptation 
uh, there in the garden, how the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field that God had created. And Satan worked through him to beguile and to deceive Eve. And she ate of the forbidden fruit, gave her husband and he ate of it. And that disobedient act constituted sin. Yep. And it brought forth death. It separated them from their creator. Amen. Read right on in that chapter and you'll read where they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they ran and hid. Amen. Ran and hid themselves from God. And God called out, Where art thou, Adam? Why, he said, I was naked and I was ashamed. God began then to uh, speak to him and pronounce sentence against him, the woman, against the serpent, and against the earth, the very earth upon which we live. Why, he said, I'll curse the ground for your sake. And you'll eat of it, and by the sweat of your face, you'll labor uh, and live of the ground. For he said, Thou art dust, and unto dust shalt thou return. He drove them out of the garden. Fellowship with God was broken. Brother, sin, spiritual, I mean death, spiritual death took hold the very moment they sinned against God. Spiritual death ensues the moment you commit an act against God. Amen. Amen. Then he pronounced death there in the third chapter in the 19th verse. He pronounced natural death. Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return, he said. Now listen, I say again that sin brought spiritual death. Amen. Death ensues the very moment you transgress the laws of God. Brother, sister, I don't care whether you want to accept it or not, it's true anyway. When you transgress the laws of God, that transgression constitutes sin, and that sin brings death into your soul Amen. and separates you from the Almighty God. Amen. People who say they live in sin, little more or less every day, and yet they're a Christian, are grossly deceived. Amen. Brother, no Christian is living in sin. Amen. Sin brings forth death to the soul. Now, when I say death to the soul there, and when the Bible teaches it, it does not mean cessation of the soul. It doesn't mean the soul ceases to exist. It means spiritual death and separation prevails in that soul while it exists. Amen. Remember, the soul of man is immortal. Amen. It'll be in existence forever. But yet it exists in the sinner in a state of death and separation from God, no fellowship with God. Amen. Ezekiel 18 and 4, the writer said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Amen. Isaiah the prophet said in the 59th chapter, the first two verses, The Lord's hand isn't shortened that he cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear, but he said, Your iniquity have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sinner, your own sins have separated you from God. Your own disobedience to the laws of God has brought spiritual death into your soul. Spiritual death and separation from God. Then, in Romans 6 and 23, Paul said the wages of sin is death. In Ephesians 2 and 1, he said, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Then in 1 Timothy 5 and 6, Paul said, That she that liveth in pleasure, and I'll add also, he that liveth in pleasure, is dead while he lives. No doubt in my mind there's a lot of dead people right here tonight. Spiritually dead. These texts reveal the fact to us that we can be spiritually dead while we're alive physically, and that's the condition of every sinner. That's the condition of every sinner. That's one death the Bible speaks about. 
It also speaks of physical death, natural death. In Genesis 3.19, the Lord pronounced the death sentence when he said, Dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. In Ecclesiastes 3 and 20, the wise man said, All are of the dust, and all turn to dust. You're not worth very much, friend, in some respects. Just a little chunk of dust. Just a little bit of clay. But that soul within is worth more than all the world. Then in Hebrews 9 and 27, Paul said, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Brother, there's two deaths mentioned in the Bible, and sin brings forth both of them. Amen. Now the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, 12, that death has passed upon all men. For that all have sinned. He said in that verse, by one man, sin entered into the world, and death came by sin, so death passed upon all, for that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Now let me say this. If God's eternal word speaks, and death is passed upon all mankind, and it does, then I'll say that this first resurrection is an absolute necessity or we'll die and miss heaven in the end. Amen. If the death sentence passed upon us all because we were all in sin and disobedience to God, then I say it's necessary for all to have part in the first resurrection, which is a spiritual resurrection, or be lost forever. Now, Jesus, in our scripture lesson, or in these two verses, uh, text 24 and 25, Jesus gives us the condition for taking part in the first resurrection, which is a spiritual resurrection. Amen. He said, first of all, he that heareth my word. Amen. Oh, that God would give us open ears and receptive hearts to hear the words of Christ. He that heareth my word, listen, dear ones, you're going to have to tune your ears to the words of God, the word of Christ, and listen to him. Brother, he is the word. He's the author of our salvation, the finisher of our faith, and the gospel is his word, and we must realize the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You can't ignore the gospel or rebel against the gospel and be a child of God. Amen. You can't ignore one bit of the scriptures. You can't rebel against one iota of truth and be a Christian or be saved. Amen. Amen. No doubt in my mind but what a lot of folks last night hardened their hearts and stiffened their neck last night as they heard truth go forth. Can't do it and be a child of God. Jesus said, He that heareth my word. You may never and probably never will understand all of it, but you'll have to have a spirit within you that says yea and amen to every bit of it. Amen. amen. It isn't hard for God to teach or God to lead a true child of God because within that soul, brother, there's been a complete capitulation to the Almighty God. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth thee. Amen. Jesus said, you'll have to hear my word. Amen. Then he said, you'll have to believe on him. The certainly. Then it means not only hearing the words of Jesus, it means having faith in God. Amen. Have a living faith. A living faith means, I say, not only hearing the words of Jesus, but it means having faith in God. Amen. And that goes a little deeper than just saying, I believe God lives today. Amen. Oh, a lot of 
people say, I believe God yeah. is. I believe there's a creator. I believe there's a God holding this thing in their hands anytime. I believe Christ is the Son of God. I believe the Bible is His Word. Brother, it takes that, but we'll have to go deeper than that. Oh, what a faithless generation we're living in today. And right in the ranks of religion. Brother, people's faith being destroyed day after day. God give us receptive hearts, I say, and willing hearts that we can say, Lord, we believe you. Not a passive faith, but a living faith in God. Brother, listen, if our faith is real, if it's genuine, it'll produce love for God, trust in God, and obedience to God. That's the kind of faith we need. That was us to trust him. Set for two conditions there, didn't they? Hearing my word and believing on him that sent me. Here once this spiritual resurrection takes place at the time we repent of our sins. Amen. A spiritual resurrection that takes place right then and there. Amen. Listen to what Paul says over here in the second chapter of Ephesians. The first few verses. Let's read here uh, just a few verses. Starting at verse 1, And you have he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and in sin, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Paul speaking there in the second and third verse about the old life of sin. He said, in time past, you saints at Ephesus, you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, you walked according to the spirit that's now working in the children of disobedience. That's the way we everyone walk at a certain time in our life, desiring to fulfill the lust of the flesh and the desires of the flesh and mind. Oh, I thank God tonight, brothers, that while I was down there in the depths of sin, seeking those things to gratify the old fleshly man, the Almighty God looked down from his throne in heaven and saw me down here on his footstool. And he called one day and he said, Holy Spirit, I want you to go down there and speak to that young man. I can use him. Glory be to God tonight, brother. I wasn't looking for God when I got saved. He was looking for me. What do you mean you wasn't looking for God? I wasn't interested in God. I wasn't looking for Him. Brother, I was looking for the thing that would gratify the old lust of the flesh. But God came in the darkness of sin and put conviction on the soul. Listen, all he had to do was just withdraw and let me alone. And I'd have plunged my way right on into an eternal hell. Amen. I say tonight, if God speaks to you, you're one of the most highly honored creatures on his footstool. Amen. Amen. Sinner friend, if God calls at your door tonight, you can thank him that he loves you to the point that he'll even stop and call you. Amen. Amen. Oh, I thank him tonight that he found me in the depths of sin. Amen. Yes, I was a child of wrath by nature, and so was you. Yes. So was you. I was bound by the spirit of the day, the spirit of the age, yes. going right on just like all the rest of the multitudes were going. But thank God for that day when a miracle of miracles took place in my heart. Yes. 
Oh, glory be to God for that first resurrection. Yes, sir, fell on the knees at a place of prayer and repented and turned loose. Forsake your sin. God isn't going to take them away from you. You're going to have to let go of them. You're going to have to turn away from your sin and let go of them and repent of them and believe in God. He'll lift that old load of sin. Well, glory. I thought when Brother Mitchell was praying, come on the ground yesterday, and he said, a weight, 10,000 ton weight lifted off of me. Brother, I don't know how great the weight was, but I remember almost 33 years ago in Huntington, West Virginia, when God lifted the load from my soul. I came alive, born spiritually, resurrected spiritually. You can call it conversion and you're still all right. You can call it the new birth and you're still all right. But brother, call it either one of them if you want. Still in bounds of scripture, but it's still a resurrection and it's a spiritual one. That's the first one. Amen. Paul went on there to say, and time passed, we walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now work in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had our conversations in time past. In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, oh, I'm glad for that. While we've gone the downward road to a lost eternity, Paul said, but God, but God, yes, sir, God stepped in. Aren't you glad? Amen. God stepped in. But God, he said, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin. Get it, brother? He loved us. When we were dead in sin, we were living a sinful life. We were dead spiritually, but alive physically. And in that condition, God in mercy loved us. And he went on to say, even when we were dead in sin, hath quickened us, hath resurrected us. Not a bit of difference in the word resurrect or quicken there. Yeah. Has quickened us yeah. together with Christ. Amen. By grace are you saved. Yeah. Brother, it's evident he's talking about the experience of conversion. Yeah. By grace are you saved. Yeah. And have raised us up together and caused us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now listen, we heard last night the necessity of being baptized with the Holy Ghost. And many people miss the mark of the baptism of the Holy Ghost because they don't have a genuine experience of the new birth. Oh, that we could get it drilled into people today. Your salvation is not complete experimentally until you're converted or spiritually resurrected. Subsequent to that, you're baptized with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Then your salvation is complete. <laughs> the three experiences. But, brother, we're going to have to have a sound biblical experience of conversion before we'll ever be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Now, you might minimize the experience of conversion if you want to, but it won't, do, it won't affect me in the least. Because I was there one night when a man got converted. And I know, brother, that God wrote a miracle in that man. Amen. I know he wasn't the same man after he got up from that altar of prayer that night. 
and he didn't know one thing about sanctification. He merely repented of sin and forsook sin and God wrought a miracle there and that man was no longer the same. He was a new creature. Old things were passed away. Behold, all things became new that very night. Oh, glory to God, I'm glad for it. Amen. I still remember it. Sixteen miles home and driving home that night, brother, is about as bright as it was on noonday. Amen. The next morning, the world was all dressed up different. The birds had a different song. Everything was different. Amen. No, the world had, was just like it always was. The world hadn't changed a bit. The birds were singing the same songs they'd been singing. Everything was going along just like it always went. But brother, the change was in here. Amen. There's a different fellow in there looking out through these two windows. Amen. Things look different to him. Because the miracle had been wrought in his soul. Amen. Things will look different too if you get converted. Amen. A lot of folks have a lot of religion, but it's dead, so dead that it stinketh. But now, brother, God has such experience for you. That'll bring you life. Amen. He's raised us up together. By grace we're saved. Thank God for that first resurrection. Amen. I say tonight, beloved, we've been forgiven, delivered, redeemed, and we're walking with God. Amen. He's a living God. He's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Go with me over here to Colossians, the third chapter, the first few verses. Paul said, if ye then be risen with Christ. Now here he comes along talking about a resurrection too. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Now listen, Paul here is speaking to people who are risen with Christ and a partaker of his life, yet they're living in a physical man. Amen. Amen. There's a resurrection we can take part in right here now. May God help us to see that tonight. A spiritual resurrection. Now he said, if you're risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above. Listen, beloved, Christ came the first time to resurrect the spirits of men and put a new spirit in there, an eternal spirit in there. He's coming the second time to resurrect the body and give us an immortal body to go with that everlasting spirit. Thank God. And I say tonight, if you're a true child of God, been born in the Spirit, or repented and had part in that first spiritual resurrection, if you'll be true and faithful to God, one of these days He'll give you a body that'll be an immortal one. Amen. I'm looking forward to it, brother. I don't believe I'll have any headaches. I don't believe I'll be sick with that new one. Glory be to God. If I can put up with this in a little while longer, there's a new one that'll be mine on that day. Amen. Wonderful to think about. Wonderful to think about. Listen, people don't seek those things which are above because they're not risen with Christ. Amen. There's a lot of people profess to be God's children, profess to be Christians, yet their affections are set on things right here on the earth. It's an evident fact they've never been risen with Christ. Our affections must be lifted from the things of this old world and centered on heavenly things, and they will be if we've been resurrected with Jesus Christ. Now that I say this spiritual resurrection will produce a different life, it'll produce a holy life. 
Ah, uh, listen, brother, you quit the sin business at conversion or you'll never get sanctified. Amen. Some folks have the idea, I can do some things, I'm not sanctified. You can't do them, Brother Green. You're sanctified. That's right. Listen, the justified man can't do one sin, the sanctified man can't do. And retain his experience with God. That's right. Brother, when we repent of our sin, the blood is applied. We're forgiven, we're delivered. Sin has come to an end in that life. Yeah. Amen. This spiritual experience, or spiritual resurrection, will produce a new life. It'll produce a holy life. Amen. We'll quit the sin bed. Brother, I got saved on Thursday night. Spiritually resurrected on Thursday night. And Friday night was cottage prayer meeting. I was there. I wasn't down the pool room. No, no, brother. And let me tell you, I haven't been back to the pool room since. Amen. 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 And next week, I didn't go to the movies either. And I've been Amen. going every week. Amen. Amen. The movies went out the door. Yeah. Amen. I'll tell you another thing, secret too. I don't have a movie in my home either. Amen. 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 Set your affections on things above. Not on things on the earth. This spiritual experience will produce a new life. Amen. And if everybody that professed to be God's children had taken part in the first resurrection, they'd be living different lives. Amen. They'd be living different lives. Amen. This spiritual resurrection, if you please, means, or this experience of conversion means coming alive spiritually, partaking of the life of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now in Revelation 20 and 6, John said, Blessed and holy is he, which has part in the first resurrection. Where did he start to become holy? When he sanctified? No. We took part in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Well, what is the second death? It's hell. The lake of fire is the second death. And the man that's been spiritually resurrected, hell has no jurisdiction over him. He's alive forevermore. If he'll keep walking. You got to keep walking. Amen. Amen. You got to keep walking. Don't stay in that justified state too long. Move on. Be baptized with the Holy Ghost. You say, I don't understand it. I didn't either, but I got sanctified without it. Glory be to God. Amen. I didn't Amen. understand it. Amen. I went to an altar to get sanctified, and they talked me out of it. I didn't get it. I went home and up in the back bedroom in an old rocking chair. Nobody but me and God, we fixed it out. Sometimes people get in the way. And when me and the Lord got alone, we get along all right. We got the thing settled and I got the experience. Glory be to God. And I didn't understand it either. But brother, I had heard in my childhood that there was an experience of sanctification and my own experience told me you need something you don't have. And I knew no one else to go to but God. And I said, Lord, I want to be sanctified. Amen. And when I met the conditions and believed in brother, the fire fell. Amen. I put a lot of fuel on it since then and it's still burning. Thank God. Amen. Thank God. I say tonight, beloved, this is the need of the hour in the religious world today. The spiritual resurrection, that's the starting point. Need to take part in the spiritual resurrection. Amen. There wouldn't be so much play religion if people had part in the first resurrection. People are playing religion today, if you please. 
They're playing it. I say there wouldn't be so much lightheartedness and frivolity and indifference toward the word when it goes forth. If there's more people had part in the first resurrection. People have got the idea that when the preacher sounds out the word and lays judgment to the line and righteousness of the plumber, if they don't like it, they just kind of turn up their nose and say, well, that's just his idea. You better be careful, friends. You turn God's word aside yeah. and lose your precious soul. That's right. Amen. Have you had part in the first resurrection? Is there something alive down in your soul? Is the services of God a real thrill and a real joy to you? Yeah. Amen. I don't have to go to church in Sunday school. No, I never have had to go. Amen. Brother, the first payday I got a bought myself a Bible. And I got a notebook. And I began to take notes on every preacher would come my way. I still got them. They're brown and aged, 30 some years old now, but I still read them. And I was in every service, brother, I could get it. It wasn't back on the back seat. Amen. Amen. I was up on the second seat. Yes, Brother, you have part in the first resurrection. All things will take on a different appearance then. Yes. Amen. I say there wouldn't be so much dead religion and so many dead, dried up services if more people who profess to love God had a had part in the first resurrection. Amen. May God help us tonight. Friends, I ask you as we draw this service to a close with an invitation song, have you had part in the first resurrection? Do you have a living experience of Christ in your soul tonight? Can you look toward heaven and say you know in your heart that you've been born of the Spirit, that you've forsaken sin, repented, and you've been spiritually resurrected. Can you say that? With a definite, positive assurance in your heart, it's true. Amen. Amen. This service is yours tonight. It's for you tonight. If you're here in sin, if you're in a backslidden condition, if you've just cooled off and become lukewarm, remember God's already spit you out if you're in a backslidden condition. Admit it. Do the first works over again. That's the only way back. Amen. Amen. May God help us tonight. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we bow our heads in your presence again in prayer this evening, thanking the Lord for this service tonight, for every song, for every message and song. We thank the Lord for the Word of God that teaches us of the wonderful experience we can have that will lift us out of a dead state in sin, reconcile us unto God, and put everlasting life within our soul. Father, we've done our best. We commit the message. We commit the remaining moments into your hands. Speak to souls here tonight, Lord. Oh, God, rebuke the power of the enemy tonight. Remove and rebuke any lightness. Any frivolity, Lord. My God, sober up every heart and mind here tonight. And may every one of us realize we're on our way to eternity. May that sinner realize he's been brought right in the presence of God tonight through the preached word. Father, let conviction fall upon his heart and draw him to this altar of prayer. Give us some precious souls and we'll give your name the praise for it. Amen. Now as we stand to sing, let's hold steady, friends. Now we stand. Be in an attitude of prayer. Amen. Page 98. 98.
sure in this audience there's needs tonight. There's spiritual needs tonight. Friend, why not bring them to the Lord this very hour? Jesus said the hour is coming and now it is. It's right here now. If you'll hear the voice of the Son of God, if you'll listen, if you'll obey, God will do wonders in your heart. Why are we sing on? Will you come tonight? Sinner, backslider, listen to the voice of God. Will you come tonight? Why are we sing? You my tonight you've already had part in the first resurrection but you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit you need to come tonight without any pleading any begging any exhortation you ought to walk out you know dear ones we can't get saved unless we just yield everything to God Lord I'll go all the way with you and it takes in sanctification Oh, but I don't understand it. I say I didn't understand it either, but I got sanctified without it. Amen. Don't draw back, friend. You'll not go far in a justified state. You need the Holy Spirit living in your heart. You need that old nature burn out of there and destroy. Yes, we've been hearing of two cleansings and it's all through the Word of God. Amen. Come on tonight while we sing. Listen to your better judgment. Listen to the voice of God. Come on while we sing. Our Lord in for you sinner as I said a few moments ago you can feel yourself highly honored that God will even speak that he'll even call you oh I'm glad for the truth there in the second chapter of Ephesians where Paul said that God in mercy loved us while we were dead in trespasses and in sin sinner the Lord loves you tonight but he doesn't love that sin in your life he doesn't love the way you're living but he loves you and desires to lift you out of that life of sin breaking his power hear him tonight friend don't reject him any longer come on while we sing
our heads in prayer again. Amen. Our loving Heavenly Father, we look to Thee again this evening, yes. asking, O oh God, yes. Thou wilt rebuke the powers of the Do enemy Lord. that would hold precious souls in his clutches tonight. We pray, God, You'll rebuke this spirit and give liberty to precious souls to step out tonight. Oh, God, uh, we ask You right now, yes, let conviction deepen on those uh, precious hearts right. away from thee. My God, give us precious souls here. Amen. With heads still bowed. With heads still bowed. The saints pray. Sinner, won't you listen to God tonight? Won't you listen to God? Listen to your better judgment. Everything's in your favor tonight. Yes, God's here to save you. Plenty of thank you to pray with you. Why not tonight? There isn't a soul in the building that would say to me, I want to lose my soul. I intend to lose it. You don't intend to lose it. But friend, procrastination. All oh, the thief of time. It's robbed millions of their souls. They intended fully to get right with God, but they said not tonight. Oh, tomorrow. And tomorrow night. Friend, tomorrow night may never come for you. The sun may never rise for you. God may call you before the dawn of a new day. Won't you listen to him tonight? Break loose and give him your heart. While the saints are praying. While God's talking to your heart. Come on, friend. Will you come? What? Do you hear that voice tonight, friend?